distinguished panelists and guests, on behalf of UNHCR and UNDP, we thank you for joining us today for this event to showcase our global partnership on forced displacement, organized as part of the Development Dialogue Series. Today, we will hear from UNDP and UNHCR colleagues in countries, regions, and headquarters about their experiences of working together for refugees, IDPs, and host communities. We will also hear from our government partner in Lebanon and the European Commission, their reflections of such humanitarian development collaboration. I am Henning Wu from UNDP, and I will be moderating this first part of the agenda before handing over to my colleague, Pedro Mendez from UNHCR. Just a few uh, house rules. We welcome your active interaction. So please use the chat and the Q&A boxes for comments and questions throughout the presentations. When posting your question, please introduce yourself, indicate who your question is for, and uh, please share with everyone. This session will be recorded, and the recording and a summary of this event will be shared by email and also available online. Without further ado, it is my great honor to introduce Ms. Asako Okai, the UNDP Assistant Secretary General and Crisis Bureau Director, followed by Mr. Rauf Mazu, UNHCR Assistant High Commissioner for Operations, to open this event. Ms. Asako, uh, Ms. Okai and Mr. Mazu, uh, uh, um, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Hany. Excellencies, distinguished participants, colleagues, and friends. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this development dialogue event together with my dear colleague, Assistant High Commissioner for Operations of UNHCR, Ralph Mazo, in, uh, in advance of the World Refugee Days on 20th June. While our collaboration dates back in 1960s, in 2017, UNDP and UNHCR principles committed to deepening our strategic partnership through leveraging our complementary strengths and mandates. We agreed to fulfill the imperative to leave no one behind in the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda by ensuring that refugees, asylum seekers, internally displaced persons, and host communities all benefit equitably from development progress. Four years on, this agreement has led to mushrooming of joint collaboration in over 30 countries, as well as regional partnerships spanning refugee situations. In the Syrian uh, situation, uh, for example, which is the largest refugee crisis in the world, UNDP and UNHCR have been collaborating with five host governments and 270 international and national partners through uh, what we call the Regional Refugee and Resilience Plan, or 3RP. And this plan has provided half a million people with cash assistance, helped over 44,000 individuals into uh, employment, and issued over 76,000 work permits to Syrian refugees in Jordan. Distinguished participants, the need to work together has never been stronger. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, for the first time in 30 years, global human development tumbled backwards. In the meantime, the number of forced displaced people continued to rise to another record high, close to 90 million, according to the latest estimate, although the precise number will be shared by UNHCR shortly on World Refugee Day. The nature of forced displacement crisis has become more protracted and intractable. The drivers and consequences of both internal and cross-border displacement are the result of increasingly complex interaction among socioeconomic, political, security, and the environmental factors. In this respect, Internal Displacement Monitoring Center's 2021 Global Report on the Internal, uh, the internal displace, uh, Displacement shows uh, that the disasters triggered more than three quarters of the new internal displacements worldwide in 2020. It also pointed out that convergence of conflict and dis disasters led to many people being displaced for a second or even third time increasing and prolonging their vulnerability. 
when IDPs, refugees and asylum seekers do not have freedom of movement or access to decent jobs and social protection, and when they and their children lack adequate education and training opportunities, the cycle of aid dependency, vulnerability and poverty is bound to continue. Reversing these trends requires concerted effort to work together at scale. More investment is needed toward joined up gender responsive interventions that bridge together development, humanitarian, peace and security, human rights and climate actors. In this connection, I would like to touch upon UNDP's recent work with UN Secretary General's high level panel on internal displacement. We see it as a once in a lifetime opportunity to reframe and reset our collective approach to internal displacement, placing a much more emphasis on developmental approaches and national accountability, elevating prevention and promoting a more effective collaboration between different actors under common principles. Given how the COVID-19 pandemic is exacerbated existing vulnerabilities, we need to better understand the multidimensionality of risk, including those arising from climate change. We also need a meaningful pivot to preventing forced displacement from happening in the first place. This means better data and analytics around risks and threats, and being able to translate these into concrete preventive actions addressing adverse drivers of forced displacement. In our recent publication carried out in partnership uh, with the high level panel, which is titled Towards Development Solutions to Internal Displacement, a Political Economy Approach, we highlighted uh, that uh, uh, building uh, development solutions to uh, root, uh, solutions rooted in the political economic context opens opportunities, enable displacement affected individuals and communities as agents of change. By being actively engaged in the development processes that shape their lives, they, be uh, they become a part of the solution. Distinguished participants, our UNDP-UNHCR collaboration relies uh, on the shared belief that to, together and as part of broader interagency efforts, we can better respond to displacement crisis. Today, we will hear from government partners, UNDP and UNHCR colleagues, as well as member states about their experience of collaboration in different countries and regions. We believe uh, that with the right support and policies, forcibly displaced persons can improve their own well-being and thrive while making vital contribution to host communities development. At the Global Refugee Forum in 2019, UNDP committed to work, uh, working with UNHCR to address uh, adverse drivers for forced displacement and to strengthen rule of law and local governance and, uh, and to promote decent work through innovative digital initiatives. The UNDP and UNHCR partnership framework on rule of law and local governance helps now over 15 countries and, and to improve access uh, of uh, refugees and host communities to justice, safety and security and human rights protection systems, as well as to basic services. UNDP and UNHCR are also collaborating on innovative digital initiatives that foster the economic inclusion of refugees. In Bangladesh, UNDP, in coordination with UNHCR, adapted the portal Aspire to Innovate, A2I, to provide Rohingyas living in camps and the local host communities with online tools required to uh, develop fashion lines and connect them uh, with the international market. This model is being expanded internationally with a similar platform adapted for Syrian refugees in Turkey and displaced Venezuelans in Colombia. Building on these joint collaborations, UNDP and UNHCR are working uh, on a new global joint initiative for inclusion and solutions at the next step in this evolution, which we hope to launch this year. 
with a focus on accelerating development solutions for refugees, IDPs, and host communities, the Global Initiative intends to establish a joint facility to support bold and innovative actions that can be scaled up, starting with 10 priority countries or situations. This transcend collaboration between our two organizations will seek to enhance human capabilities and expand opportunities for their forcibly displaced and host communities with a specific emphasis on women. We want to make sure that refugees and IDPs do not just survive, but thrive and flourish together. I look forward to our discussions today. Thank you. Over back to you, Henny. Thank you, Asako. Um, and uh, welcome to Mr. Ralph Mazu. Um, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Henny, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Asako. Very, very pleased to be, to be uh, joining you today. Distinguished guests, uh, dear, dear colleagues, um, UNDP and UNHCR have worked together uh, for decades uh, to address the needs of the most vulnerable and marginalized uh, in forced displacement uh, situations. And in the past four years, as uh, Asako has said, since the joint communication between Administrator Steiner and High Commissioner Gandhi, we have been collaborating closely in key thematic and operational areas, structuring and strengthening an already solid partnership between the two uh, agencies. Uh, the continuous growth and the increasingly protracted nature of forced displacement around the world has highlighted the importance of introducing development approaches to our response as early as possible. And this is what the Global Compact on Refugees, affirmed by the UN General Assembly in December 2018, is about. Supporting both refugees and their hosts through the provision of uh, integrated uh, and sustainable uh, support. At the Global Refugee Forum in, in December, as you said, Asako, uh, UNDP was among the agencies uh, that made the most consequential uh, pledges in this area. This approach very much uh, aligns with the purpose of the 2030 Agenda, which aims at identifying and overcoming obstacles preventing marginalized populations from contributing to and benefiting from uh, inclusion in sustainable social and economic development processes. The joint uh, UNDP UNHCR action plan has been the main framework for our partnership. Uh, it includes collaboration in areas such as SDGs, rule of law uh, and local governance, peace building, uh, IDPs, livelihood, uh, now of course COVID-19 and regional context. Uh, we have agreed to update and renew this framework by developing a new global joint initiative specifically structured around UNDP's pledges at the first global refugee forum. The new initiative will strengthen joint programming, focusing on preparedness before a crisis, protection, assistance, and recovery during a, a crisis and stabilization uh, and development afterwards. We will also hear during this event about some of the ongoing all-plan collaboration at regional levels, such as in Syria, Afghanistan, the north of Central America, but also in Colombia, Ethiopia, the Central Sahel, and Lake Chad Basin regions. Among um, our key areas of collaboration, let me emphasize how, as a protection and solution agency, we value UNDP's expertise in rule of law and local governance. We are looking forward to uh, further advancing our collaboration with the NDP in this thematic area. Our joint efforts around jobs and livelihoods uh, are also being strengthened following UNDP's pledge to the uh, GRF. We also applaud UNDP's engagement in IDP context as reflected in discussion with the high level panel on internal displacement and in the recent report on uh, development solutions to uh, internal displacement. The search for solutions uh, has been a gap in the response to IDP situations. And we are looking forward to collaborating with the NDP on addressing this issue. Finally, following on the Global Forum in 2019, 
I would like to remind all of us uh, of the high level official meeting coming up in December this year, which aims at taking stock of progress and maintaining the momentum towards achieving the objectives of the Global Compact on, on Refugees. As we continue in partnership to build on the pledges made by UNDP at the GRF, the high level official meeting will provide a key opportunity to identify areas where further engagement is needed to increase support, self-reliance and access to uh, solutions for refugees, taking into consideration, of course, the new challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Reflecting on the solid partnership between UNDP and UNHCR here today and charting a way forward to strengthen it further also contribute to this momentum, which is so crucial to protecting and finding solutions for persons of concern to UNHCR. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Okai, and also Mr. Mazu for helping to frame and set the historical and broader context of this collaboration. Um, I understand that both of you will have to leave us soon, but thank you so much in advance for making the time. Um, now I'm pleased to introduce Ms. Roberta Russo, Senior Partnerships Advisor in the UNHCR Division of Resilience and Solutions, and Mr. Luca Randa, uh, Head of the Recovery Solutions and Mobility Team in the UNDP Crisis Bureau who will provide an overview of the global partnership, which has been captured in a compilation of good practices. Go ahead, um, Roberta and Luca, you have the floor. Yes. Thank you very much, Hani. Distinguished guests, uh, participants and colleagues, um, greetings. Let me start with a few numbers. As, if it, as, if it, were, as it was mentioned before, uh, UNHCR is about to release uh, new numbers for the World Refugee Days. New numbers that unfortunately on, uh, uh, see the same trend in the last decade, and there is an, which is upwards. We see um, a continuous increase of forcibly displaced populations in the world, while, um, next slide, uh, please, talking about numbers. Thank you very much, Luca. So we see a continued tra continuous trend of upwards numbers in terms of a number of uh, forcibly displaced populations. But on the other hand, when we talk about solutions, that is obviously the focus of our work with UNDP, there is a decrease uh, in the last decade. We, say, we saw a dramatic decrease in the number of people, for example, uh, returning to their country, country of origins, refugees returning. We are seeing, um, uh, there is a widespread recognition on the complexities of the causes of forced displacement and climate change has emerged uh, uh, and uh, as one of the of the main uh, causes of uh, displacement together with conflict and we have dramatic uh, forecasts on the number of people that in in the next um, years will be displaced because of the environmental degradation and climate change uh, there is also widespread recognition about uh, the link that there is between uh, forced displacement and poverty. And this is the link that is uh, a little bit at the core of our uh, collaboration and our partnership with UNDP. And that brings us together. So in the next slide, we will see uh, and go through very quickly the milestones that um, have um, of our collaboration uh, with UNDP. We have been collaborating since the 60s. And uh, in 1987, we, um, we signed the first global cooperation agreement. Uh, but then in, in 2017, we agreed on a joint action plan uh, that would guide our collaboration in the field. And we're now in 2021 launching a new global joint initiative for inclusions and solutions. And uh, our action is obviously guided by the sustainable development goals. I just want to spend a couple of words on what our what what brings us together in these partnerships and 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 the, what our common goals are. 
So the progress towards uh, the GCR objectives, we are all familiar with the GCR objectives and uh, three in particular out of the four. So the one on easing the pressure on host uh, countries, the second one on enhancing self-reliance of refugees and the fourth one on supporting conditions for returns are really guiding our, our joint action. Uh, first displacement um, and um, first displacement is a development issue and there is a recognition about this now and the focus has to be on solution but solutions are only achievable if humanitarian and development partners work together. Um, the, the partnership of uh, UNDP and UNHCR is tes testimony of, this, of the importance of these actors uh, working together. Um, just a few words on what uh, UNDP brings into this work, into the uh, in, into the partnership, really. Um, um, Mazou, the Assistant High Commissioner for Operation, already mentioned what uh, the expertise and, and the value of their expertise in rural in rule of law and governance that uh, UNDP brings. I just want to bring us our, our attention on two. Uh, other aspects that we value in particular, and it's the long-term perspective of, of UNDP on development issues and solutions, and the unique role that UNDP has as an actor interfacing on behalf of the UN with, uh, with hosting governments. Hosting governments, which are the key actor uh, uh, that has a say and that enables the socioeconomic inclusion of uh, refugees in countries, and that enables them to live a life in, in dignity and to contribute to the, the, their society, not only in their country of asylum, but also in their country of return when they are allowed uh, to, to return to their homes. With this, I'll give the word to Luca, to, to, who will elaborate then uh, before even giving the word to the colleagues in the field about uh, the proof of concept and what this translates into in terms of uh, programming uh, aimed at uh, improving the lives of the people we care for. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Roberta. Um, I will uh, <clears throat> shortly uh, and you know briefly uh, uh, talk about the geographical focus of our uh, collaboration, uh, both in terms of the regional platform but also the country level. And thank you very much for for highlighting so so well uh, the complementarity of the mandate and the strengths of the two organization and how. Uh, together, actually, uh, we can be uh, definitely uh, more effective in, in, in finding those solutions. Um, so in terms of um, uh, support to uh, at, the, at the field level, we have um, uh, first uh, uh, the, the level of the regional platform. We have three regional platforms that were launched at the Global Refugee Forum. So the SSR, which is the support platform for uh, the solutions for Afghan refugees. Um, we uh, are working on the MIRPS, which is the, the support platform for um, Central America and Mexico, uh, which is uh, uh, also um, uh, functions in, in collaboration with the OAS and the and ECLAC, as well as the EGAD, which is an intergovernmental um, uh, authority on development, but as a support platform that supports all uh, refugee situation in uh, EGAD countries, very active in, in case of the Somalia refugee, for example, but also in Sudan, South Sudan. All of these uh, are part of the uh, commitment of UNDP at the GCR, the support to the, to the, to the regional platform. And uh, this will be uh, also part of our future plans in terms of uh, expanding that joint work uh, in these three contexts. In terms of, um, uh, this is a map that shows where uh, the two agencies are working together. It, it is uh, around 30 countries at, at, at the moment. There are different levels of engagement, admittedly. In some countries, it's, it's uh, a lot deeper. Uh, in others, it's uh, maybe just around one or two initiatives. But here you have, for example, um, cases where UNDP and UNHCR co-lead on, uh, on a response plan, for example, a regional refugee response plan in, in, in Congo in Burundi, Nigeria, uh, the case of the th Syrian uh, 3RP. And uh, we, we do have 
we have made commitments uh, as part of the Global Refugee Forum to, to further expand that, that collaboration and deepen it. Um, in, the, in the recent publication, um, it's called the uh, UNDP NHR a Partnership of Forced Displacement. Uh, we have collected an example of, of a few countries where, uh, in our view, uh, they showcase you know, the best example, the best practice of, of collaboration. So you have, uh, for example, the case of Afghanistan, where we work on, on uh, access to jobs together with ILO, the case of Cameroon, where we focus on, on social cohesion, and DRC, when the, the work is, is uh, very much on municipalities and uh, working with the local police uh, in Colombia, uh, a lot around IDPs and, uh, and the inclusion of, of this uh, uh, thematic in the uh, territorial development plans. Uh, the case of Lebanon, where the partnership is, is uh, really very strong around uh, area-based uh, integrated approaches of rule of law, justice, police, a lot of uh, infrastructure uh, uh, project as well for uh, to increase um, to invest in the local economy. Uh, in Turkey, when we work around uh, uh, access to to jobs together with the private sector, etc. So these are some of the uh, example of of the, the, the best example, we'd say, of, of collaboration between the between the two agencies. Now, looking forward. Uh, um, uh, there was a mention of um, the uh, the joint uh, the global joint initiative, but what we we will see is first of all we are trying to create more capacity to drive this uh, partnership, uh, and we are creating a senior position, a jointly funded senior position in Geneva that will be uh, really tasked to to take this uh, to, to drive the partnership uh, forward. Uh, there will be more engagement at the policy level. Uh, the, the, our, our both uh, Asako and Raouf have mentioned areas where the, the, the collaboration needs to be deepened, for example, climate change, uh, use of data to, to anticipate uh, trends and uh, for prevention purposes. Um, we're looking more and more on, on uh, jobs and, and livelihoods through digital solutions and partnership with private sector. And of course, the focus will remain uh, on the current area like rule of law, working with local government, municipalities, social cohesion and peace building. Uh, we're also developing joint work plans, for example, in the Sahel, Southern Africa. Uh, we will work on the regional platform, particularly I would say SSR is coming, it is, is, is becoming um, an important forum to look at um, the, the situation, particularly in Afghanistan and how we can uh, further uh, strengthen our, our work there. Um, extracting best practices, for example, from the 3RP, we had a recent evaluation at the executive board uh, that showed uh, in UNDP, uh, from the evaluation office UNDP with the decision of the executive board that recognized how important the 3RP has been in, in fostering this uh, collaboration between humanitarian and development partners. We are looking at complementing this with a joint uh, a facility that would uh, hopefully with the support of some of the, our donor partners have some uh, funds to pilot initiative to further development uh, programming tools and test uh, hypotheses and then replicate them uh, when successful. So uh, with that, I, I will close uh, the, the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Henny, over to you. Thank you, um, Ms. Russo and Mr. Renda for the preview to the compilation. Um, now, um, I'm keen to move on to hear from our uh, colleagues in the field who are, who are really truly working on the front line. Um, in the next panel, we are very honored to have a joint presentation by Ms. Jessica Fayeta, um, UNDP resident representative, and Joseph Parks, also UNHCR representatives in both in Colombia. And this will be followed by a presentation by Mr. Ilya Todorovic, um, UNHCR head of sub office in the Gambela region, which is one of the poorest regions in Ethiopia, um, which are generously hosting uh, Sudanese refugees. We are especially appreciative that Ms. Faita and uh, Mr. Marx that you can join us today during the, especially during the UNHCR High Commissioner's visit uh, to Colombia. And as we understand, there is also an R4B uh, donor conference uh, and on the Venezuelan situation. Thank you very much. And over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Henny. Thank you very much for to, for the invitation. It's um it's a real pleasure for me to to 
to share this space with my colleague and friend, uh, Joseph Merckx, the, the UNHCR representative in Colombia. Uh, for the past two and a half years, Joseph and I have been actually uh, holding the coordination of the of the system. So I have been acting as a resident coordinator and uh, Joseph has been acting as humanitarian coordinator. So we have actually been working very, very closely, um, both of us. Uh, he also has another hat as, uh, as I do as the co-chair of the um, interagency working interagency group on migration flows, the GIFM as we call it in, in Colombia. So what I, what I want to do is um, just briefly provide you an, inter, uh, an overview of the country context uh, to understand how the, the, the uh, IDP situation in general has uh, so many ramifications in Colombia. And then uh, explain a little bit about the background of, of UNDP and UNHCR collaboration and uh, focus more, more deeply into one specific uh, initiative that we have going on right now, a project supported by the UN uh, Trust Fund for Human Security. So um, on, the, on the second, if uh, somebody wants to send the second, uh, put the second one. Okay, so th this, is, uh, th this slide tends to demonstrate really the, the presence and the complexity of Colombia. Um, on the one hand, we have, uh, we have uh, an internal conflict and a human mobility issue that has been actually there for, for quite some time. And the, the government has uh, officially registered 9 million victims of the armed conflict for the past um, decade or so. And of, of that, about 8 million of these are actually victims are IDPs. Um, the, the government does as you know, signed a peace agreement in, in 2016. And uh, even though a lot of the IDP has, has uh, subsided, I would say the situation, um, at least uh, 500,000 of those are newly displaced people. So we have the previous, the, the previous IDPs, but we have more right now. To these, we have an ongoing there is an ongoing conflict, especially in, in territories, in localized parts of the country uh, since 2016 that have actually um, resulted in killings of human rights defenders, uh, about close to 1,000 so far, uh, and, and also ex-combatants um, ex of, the, of the FARC have been killed, uh, or close, uh, reaching now close to 300 of them. So to this, you add a more recent phenomenon for the past um, maybe three, four years, which is the, the arrival of a large number of Venezuelan refugees and migrants. About 5.5 million Venezuelans have actually fled the country, of which um, 1.7 million, maybe a little bit more, are Venezuelan refugees and migrants are actually in Colombia right now. The rest are uh, in, in, in the rest of Latin America, and that's why we were having uh, today um, a donor conference about this because the, 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 it continues to be a very large challenge. So that's another one. And of course, um, Colombia has been in the news for, the, for regularizing these Venezuela refugees and migrants via the new temporary protection status, um, which to, to, to be frank, is continues to be an enormous challenge, especially of the socioeconomic integration and employment of these, of these um, migrants and refugees, uh, another big area of collaboration that we need to have with, uh, with the UNHCR. And to this crisis, you have, you complicate them even more. Of course, we have the COVID pa pandemic um, and uh, its economic impact. We have uh, recurring natural disasters. We recently had a hurricane five, uh, category five uh, uh, pass by um, Colombia. And, uh, and recently we've had also massive social instability and civil protests. So that just to give you a, a context of, of um, that the, the IDP situation and the human mobility is actually uh, happens in a very complex uh, uh, area in the complex situation of the country. So let me go 
to the, the next one, which is basically a little bit of background on the UNDP UNHCR partnership in Colombia. This goes, uh, there's a long history of that. Um, and it's actually been, been growing, changing, developing the concept of, of, uh, of durable solutions. Um, let me just start by saying that um, under the humanitarian ar architecture, which was established in 2006 in Colombia, UNHCR has been leading the protection cluster and UNDP has been leading the early recovery cluster within the humanitarian country team. Um, and of course, this continues to be, this continues to be part of, of uh, what we do. The, the, the humanitarian country team is a very active, um, a very active team with uh, the humanitarian um, partners. Uh, UNDP and UNHCR have also collaborated on a joint project that in fact was a worldwide pilot called Transitional Solutions Initiative on Durable Solutions. And this um, ended in 2016, and it actually focused on the capacity building of IDPs and host communities, local and, and national authorities to obtain um, durable solutions. And this uh, has had a, quite an impact and it continues to, to, to be a model in, in many ways. And in, in 2018, uh, UNDP and UNHCR, we have uh, had a, a, another kind of a, a collaboration on two platforms. One was uh, on um, the GP20, basically, and uh, the two agencies plus other uh, UN agencies and NGOs coordinated ac activities to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the guiding principles on internal displacement and basically to develop uh, recommendations and advocate for effective responses on situation of, of, of IDPs, especially with a focus on, on prevention and, and protection and durable solutions. And more recently, what uh, our work has been focused, of course, on the interagency group on mixed migration flows, the GIFM, as we call it, of which uh, Joseph and um, my colleague, the representative of IOM, are the co-chairs. Uh, and this is the main platform for UN agencies and larger NGOs. We have about 70 members into, in this platform that coordinate the response to the Venezuelan and refugee migrant crisis. Um, UNDP colleagues within this group, the subgroup of socioeconomic in inclusion within the um, within the, the GIFM jointly with, uh, with, with IOM. Um, and of course, the one we want to go a little bit more deep and, and I will pass this, uh, uh, this to, to, to Joseph is the, the implementation of the um, Trust Fund for Human Security Finance a partnership for human security project, which we which focuses on on improving on improving what in building on what we had already done before on durable solutions, and um, and peace building actually through engaging the private sector and uh, and IDPs and host communities. Um, we are implementing this in five national in five uh, municipalities of, of the country. It will run through probably next year. And one of the innovative elements of this project is that this is actually a partnership with the London School of Economics, which has assisted in convening a network of universities and, and academic researchers to actually advance the knowledge on the areas of human security. Um, and also and with particular emphasis on the, on the key role of the private sector and, and, and their needed engagement in, in the search of, of uh, durable solutions for, for peace. And an important uh, initial finding of this project is that uh, worked on our work on force displacement is actually a very key opportunity to coordinate public, private, civil society, and, and academic actors um, in advancing peace building agendas and, and development solutions with a whole of community approach that in Colombia, at least it includes not only internally displaced populations, but also um, ex-combatants in the process of reincorporation, migrants and, and, and refugees. So very, uh, we're looking forward to, 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 to the results of this project. And um, with this, I want to pass, pass this on, pass the floor to my colleague, uh, Joseph Merckx, 
to continue in a little bit more. So over to over to you, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica. Um, I think you have explained already quite clearly now how we work together, uh, UNDP and UNHCR in Colombia. And, and I think, uh, or I feel at least that we really are two uh, agencies that complement each other uh, very well in, in, in many ways uh, here in Colombia. Uh, as, as Jessica said, we are working with IDPs, refugees and migrants, host communities, returnees, Colombians that are coming back from, uh, from Venezuela, etc. And the numbers, as Jessica already showed them, are, are, are quite, uh, quite big and, and gives, they give us a, a lot of work. Uh, I, in this uh, presentation, we think it's uh, worthwhile to talk about uh, the Partnership for Human Security Project as an example how we work together, UNHCR and, uh, and UNDP specifically on forced displacement and, and the triple nexus. No, I, I think we all know in, in Colombia, we, uh, we, have, we have the peace agreement, but also still many humanitarian challenges uh, and of course also development uh, challenges. So the triple nexus is very much uh, present uh, in Colombia. The, the human security project links protection with prevention and, and risk management, supporting community and institutional protection and coping mechanisms. This includes, for example, training communities in how to dialogue effective, effectively with institutions and, and the private sector. And there are also actions to mitigate the socioeconomic effects of COVID-19 and support the prevention of public health uh, risks uh, in the same project. The project also links uh, livelihoods to, to business uh, partnerships and value chains by developing and supporting initiatives that help communities take advantage of economic opportunities in both local and national markets. We have identified within the project key value chains in the region such, such as beans, coffee, recycling, uh, and we have strengthened uh, 85 micro enterprises with uh, seed capital. The project works to strengthen local institutions, building their capacity to respond to crisis and to implement durable solutions in collaboration with a range of, uh, of stakeholders. We have uh, supported government institutions in the implementation of return, resettlement and local integration plans for IDPs and host communities. Uh, now also many times, including refugees and migrants while implementing peace building agendas and supporting local development planning. Uh, finally, as mentioned above, uh, as, as mentioned already by, by uh, uh, Jessica, we, we have a very good collaboration with the London School of Economics, uh, and we really try to maintain a multi-stakeholder approach and, and dialogue with uh, including also uh, national universities in Colombia. In the context of, of COVID-19, we have also piloted uh, an e-learning platform as well as training in digital literacy skills connectivity solutions and, and digital entrepreneurship. Uh, in total, the project uh, has uh, over 6,400 direct beneficiaries, as you can see, and over 32,000 indirect beneficiaries. Uh, hopefully we could replicate this project in, in other regions because we, we only have uh, funds to, to focus on, on certain uh, communities and municipalities where we have IDPs, ex-combatants, refugees and migrants, and of course, host community members. Next slide, please. I think also uh, this, this project uh, is a good example of uh, how UNDP and UNHCR have put into practice uh, new ways of working. Uh, the agencies work together starting from the initial joint context analysis and project design and moving into project planning and programming with an emphasis on collective uh, outcomes. The project includes a strong component of joint monitoring carried out by UNDP's and UNHCR's national and, and, and field offices to track project implementation and results in the institutions and communities. Community monitoring strategies have also been developed. The project governance uh, structure uh, ensures that the two agencies jointly manage and, and report to the national and the part, uh, department level technical committees 
which, which uh, directly include key government comfort, counterparts. Um, next slide, please. Finally, I think it's, it's worth mentioning uh, some UNDP and UNHCR joint lessons learned uh, and challenges encountered over the years from UNDP UNHCR collaboration in Colombia. As, as Jessica said, we have many, many joint uh, efforts. Uh, uh, but of course, I mean, our collaboration and, and joint projects have, have led us to develop an integrated protection and development based uh, analysis. Uh, that leads to more relevant and comprehensive operation. Uh, each agency contributes its expertise through the lens of its own mandate, but complementing each other. Additionally, this lends greater credibility and increased capacity to convene diverse actors, such as government institutions, private sector, civil society, and academia, in order to seek innovative development solutions. However, I mean, there's also lessons learned uh, related to challenges that need to be overcome. Uh, each agency, as, as we all know, has different business models with disparate financial and programmatic cycles. These can be aligned with each other, but it requires some additional effort to, to do so. Uh, and at the end, then humanitarian and development donors often have different uh, priorities and do not necessarily coordinate amongst themselves or are willing to finance nexus activities. We, we see that actually, as we speak, there is an international donor conference for the 1.8 million uh, Venezuelan refugees and migrants. Uh, and, and in the past, there has been a, a big focus on humanitarian assistance. Uh, and now we should really move to uh, a more development focused socioeconomic integration uh, as many of those refugees and migrants will have uh, a legal status in, uh, in, in Colombia. But often humanitarian and development donor agencies are at times still, still separated. Uh, and so we must all work more closely uh, to ensure coordination and funding at, at the nexus. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh... Ms. Faeta and Mr. Marx. Um, and now over to Ilya. Go ahead, Ilya. Okay, well, the power just went out, <laughs> but it came back. Uh, hello, and um, it's Ilya from the deep field. I'm here in Gambela, Ethiopia, and I'm very honored to be part of this distinguished group of panelists. Um, you heard from the previous speakers that Ethiopia is one of the 30 countries worldwide where UNDP and UNHCR have these joint programming. Ours is called the Community Safety and Access to Justice Project. I'll just call it Access to Justice to make it quicker. And the project uh, started in June of 2019 and lasted throughout uh, the end of 2020. So here is uh, the map of the context of uh, the refugee and the host community in Gambela. We have around now, the number is even higher. We have about 350,000 refugees coming from South Sudan. And as you can see, the local population is around 410,000, 409,000. So the refugee and the host populations are quite equal. Hence, projects should incorporate um, both the host and the refugees if you wanna be successful. And that's exactly what we did in this project. Next slide. So the basis for the intervention, of course, comes from many of the assessments that were done on rule of law and governance uh, following the 2016 New York Declaration and the launching of the CRF in Ethiopia, which occurred in 2017. Through all of those assessments and reports, we had many um, joint uh, missions to Gambela. It was uh, seen that Gambela really suffers from an overall weakness of security and safety structures very low knowledge, very low skills and awareness of rule of law. And this is coming from the key rule of law stakeholders, such as the police, the courts, the prosecutors, uh, it, it, on that level. So you can imagine um, the lack of awareness at the host community and refugee level. Also, over the many years, and especially recently, we've been suffering from a lot of um, conflict and tension between host and refugee communities. 
So uh, the principles that we've used in this access to justice project is uh, the one UN approach, multi-stakeholders, uh, but ensuring that the regional governor, the government takes the lead from the very beginning. Um, having a prevention oriented and cohesion and peace building strategy built in from the beginning, and then using joint partnership um, access to funding and resources mobilizing from both UNDP and UNHCR so we could have the, the funds for the project. The beneficiaries have been refugees and host communities, which as I said, very important targeting women and youth, and then various um, government actors uh, here at the regional level you can see here on the slide. The, govern the governance of the project at the steering committee was of course joint and with the key stakeholders in Gambela. Uh, the technical committee was also uh, UNHCR, UNDP and the court and ADA, which is one of the government agencies that works with migration. Next slide, and refugees. So uh, these are the results. Um, I had an earlier slide that had a lot of details, but I um, streamlined it to let you know that we carried lots of trainings of the community police in the camps, they're called shortas. We did training on human rights, refugee protection, various types of law, alternate dispute resolution mechanisms to capacitate formal and informal justice actors, both in the camps and in the host community throughout the project. We provided su support for the creation of joint opportunities uh, through business startups, which is extremely important because the camp population and the youth population in the host community is quite young here in Gambela. And we've provided a lot of mobile courts to access um, the camps, the host communities, including remote locations, uh, and, and to carry out the, the, the justice cases uh, in the criminal procedures, especially. We provided free legal aid services, uh, especially to the most neediest. And we had to respond to a changing context like everyone else in the world has to COVID. And we carried out a lot of analysis and conflict and mapping that conflict areas and seeing how the rule of law can be carried out. Next slide. So what is the value, what is the value added of having UNDP and UNHCR work on a joint project here in the deep field? And that is we came to understand that we both have leverages. We both work with different government counterparts. UNHCR tends to work with the refugee and migration authorities. UNDP tends to work more with the rule of law and the governance authorities. And so we were able to open each other's doors, especially here in Gambela. Having the government from the very beginning uh, and all levels of the government here in Gambela, including the regional authorities and then provincial and then municipality, we were able to get their buy-in to ensure that the, this project could reach both host community and ref refugees. And uh, we also saw that there was great value in integrating refugee issues into future joint development programming in Gambela that's still going on. Um, we both have technical expertise and we found that it complements each other when you come to the deep field. There was a lot of learning. It was very reciprocal of both staff, uh, of staff from the both organizations. And one really good thing is uh, by operationalizing the one UN, we were able to co-locate UNHCR staff in Gambela. They were not here before this project and with this project, they were able to make, uh, open some presence in Gambela. Next slide. So um, we have specific challenges, lessons learned. Many of these are very, very uh, grassroots, very specific to Gambela, so I won't spend too much time on it. Um, but we did have one overall one, and that was COVID-19. As you all know, it disrupted a lot in the world, and it definitely did in Gambela. Um, but some of the specific ones was the refugees tended not to report criminal cases through uh, the official uh, mobile court systems, they preferred traditional courts as they thought um, getting cows or in-kind compensation was better than seeing the perpetrators um, put under lock and key, if you want to say that. Um, you know, living in camps is not easy if you're going to be a witness to a crime. So providing witness protection is very problematic uh, in the camp setting. And this is what we have here in Gambela. We have seven camps with the 350,000 um, refugees. We also had, because of the low capacity of judges and officials um, understanding their obligations, they, they had a hard time sort of maintaining schedules and the expectations that we had from them to listen to hear a large number of cases in the camp on a particular date. So um, next slide, please. The way forward, 
is uh, we are going to continue. We're going to scale up the mobile courts. We weren't able to carry it out uh, in uh, all locations of uh, Gambela due to COVID-19. So we've done it in the first couple of months of this year. Uh, we want to carry out more joint peace efforts to enhance peaceful coexistence. That's been a major problem in, in our area between refugees and host community and also between the refugees themselves. And continue jointly to build the capacity of stakeholders and continue to raise awareness and legal trainings on human rights, the rights of women and children, family law, and strengthening, which is so important, legal aid services, especially free legal aid services and the follow-up and the support. So that's what we're doing in 2021. Next slide. And there's a picture to put act, uh, action or words into action, action into words. So here's the inaug joint inauguration of a mobile court in the Pinedo part of Gambela. It was postponed from last year and we opened it up in April, 2021. That's the end of my presentation. Looking forward to your comments. Next slide. And thank you. Thank you so much, Ilya. And um, actually, uh, we are very um, we are very pleased today to actually have um, uh, Mr. Turhan Saleh, who is uh, the UNDP resident representative, and I believe um, your teams have been working together. Uh, and he's able to join us. Thank you so much, Turhan. Um, please, over the floor to you for for just a few brief um, uh, intervention. Thank you very much, Hani. I think Ilya's made a great presentation describing the project. Let me just touch on three things. Um, first, I think we need to bear in mind the context in which we're operating. The, the, uh, Ethiopia is in, a, in the Horn of Africa, which is a very volatile region. It's marked by refugee phenomenon, migration, and significant internal displacement. So we have to bear in mind that Gabela also is one of the poorest regions, one of the smallest regions of Ethiopia, if not smallest, and also a very poor region uh, of Ethiopia. So we are seeing this phenomenon of forced displacement being uh, handled in contexts which are themselves very complex, very volatile, very uncertain, and in many cases, resource scarce, of course. So that's one thing that I'd like to sort of flag. The second thing is sort of, uh, Ilya has drawn some very, very practical, specific, and useful lessons learned, stepping back just on some macro lessons learned, if you like. One goes to the questions we have be discussing in the chat box here, which is the nexus. And I think this is a classic example on a small scale of the nexus and operation. And I think there is great value in the nexus approach, the multi-sectoral, the multi-stakeholder approach to cover both the humanitarian side, but also very much move towards the development side and bring the capabilities, as Ilya was saying, together. And I don't think we have enough of those practical experiences out there. So there is a lot of rhetoric about nexus, I must say, but there aren't that many practical examples of the nexus in operation. So we are still not in a position to say, well, does this idea really work in the field or not? I think we need to try it more. And this project is a small example of what can be done. The second is what Ilya said, and I wanna just emphasize that it's the great benefit of combining our strengths. Both UNHCR and UNDP have brought different but complementary strengths to this um, process, to this project and to this problem, to this challenge, whether in terms of our relationships, whether in terms of our technical expertise, whether it's in terms of the issues we work on. And I think that has really benefited the project and something that one can build on. The third is the issue of adaptability. Now the conditions change, Ilya mentioned COVID. COVID came in in the middle of this project and the project had to adapt. That's just one example of the adaptation that one needs constantly. And then finally, sustainability. We have a challenge now to sustain the initial gains into the medium term. And that is something to bear in mind. Final point on the way forward, we have two opportunities in Ethiopia UNDP and UNHCR to do some really important work on the nexus and take the experience of Gambela onto a, a larger canvas. One is Tigray, in Tigray, and it goes to a question actually in the box, what, how do we handle the transition between humanitarian and development? And in Tigray, we're actually proposing something called emergency recovery, which is really attempt to complement humanitarian by trying to save lives and livelihoods, but also to make sure that we work together with the humanitarians, development and humanitarians to put a floor underneath which Tigray's development conditions will not fall. Because right now there is a massive risk of a downward spiral in development conditions that could set the region back by decades, actually. It's not an exaggeration to say by decades. So we're trying to put a floor underneath that and it's humanitarian plus development, what we call emergency recovery, helping to do that. And the second, my final point, is we are going to be working together. UNHCR has just joined UNICEF, UNDP, UNHCHR, and UN Women 
in a joint UN effort to support major reform of the rule of law and justice system in Ethiopia. And we're very excited by that. So the potential to do things on a bigger scale, learning from Gambella are right there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jessica, Joseph, Turhan, and Ilya. I mean, these are all very terrific, uh, terrific insights. And, and to be honest, I, I think really it's an inspiration for our collaboration. And as, as I think Turhan said, this is you know, uh, where, where we are trying to apply the nexus uh, together. Um, it, it's, it's a shame to be closing this panel. I think we, we could have maybe dedicated the entire, <laughs> perhaps the entire hour and a half on country collaborations. And, and maybe, you know, this is a call for perhaps more opportunities to do this. But we, we now move on to the regional collaborations. And I'm very pleased to hand over to my co-moderator, Pedro uh, Mendes, who will take you through the rest of the agenda. Thank you, everybody, uh, especially, you know, coming in from the countries and in your busy schedules. Thank you so much. Thank you, Henny. Uh, and if I may, Turhan, a great thanks for, for a terrific packed explanation on the true triple nexus. Um, I'm uh, Pedro Mendes from uh, UNHCR. Uh, I will be moderating the, the next uh, segment. Uh, we are way beyond, um, beyond the schedule. Um, we'll, as uh, Henny mentioned, we'll see now uh, um, a closer look on the regional, uh, regional collaborations. Um, and uh, we will we will hear from uh, Mr. Asem Abi Ali from Lebanon. He's the general supervisor of the Lebanon Crisis Response Plan. He will obviously talk about the Series Three RP. Uh, also, Mr. Indrika Bratwate, UNHCR Director for Asia, Asia and the Pacific, uh, and Mrs. Claire uh, Van der Weyren, uh, who is the Chief of the Country Office Liaison and Coordination Division of UNDP. Uh, regional Bureau for, for Asia and the Pacific. They will speak to the solution strategy for Afghan uh, refugees or uh, SSAR. And uh, we'll hear also from uh, Mrs. Linda McGuire, UNDP Regional Bureau uh, Deputy Director uh, for uh, Latin America and the Caribbean uh, on the MIRPS uh, support platform for Mexico and Central America. Uh, and uh, for, for a, a donor perspective, uh, we will have also uh, Mr. Erwan Marte, uh, Head of Section on Migration and Forced Displacement uh, from uh, INTPA at, at the European uh, Commission. Um, begging the illustrious participants uh, to, uh, to keep the time, um, um, I, I hand the floor to Mr. Uh, Abi Ali. Thank you. Thank you. Excellencies, friends, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I would like to thank UNDP and UNHCR for organizing this important dialogue and for giving us the opportunity to share with you our insights. <clears throat> Lebanon remains at the forefront of the humanitarian crisis in Syria. Although all neighboring countries have been heavily impacted Lebanon has carried a tremendous burden and remains the country that hosts the most refugee per capita in the world with almost 1.8 million refugees. Some 97% of our municipalities host a, a refugee population of more than 500 refugees. And some studies indicate that in Lebanon, we have 1,611 cadastral zones, all resided by displaced. This makes our entire country a host community. This, of course, has an impact on the daily life of all Lebanese as municipalities and state institutions are put under additional pressure to, delivery, to deliver services to all. To this end, the support under the Lebanon Crisis Response Plan made possible by donor contributions and implemented by government, humanitarian, and development partners, along with the exceptionally hospitality of the Lebanese community, which has brought substantial, vitally needed support and prevented an even greater deterioration of the living conditions of the poor. Unfortunately, with the multifaceted crisis Lebanon is facing, this is not enough to meet the increasing needs. In 2020, the support provided by the LCRP, despite being higher than in previous years, could not counterbalance 
the deterioration of the economic situation. And now we are facing a situation where nine out of 10 Syrian displaced are living under the survival minimum expenditure basket. And we have more than 60% of the Lebanese living under poverty line. In this context, we see the need to not only continue meeting humanitarian needs, but to increase support to institutions and service delivery to mitigate the impact of the crisis in the medium term. We strongly believe in the integrated approach of the LCRP, which has contributed to enhancing the resilience of the vulnerable populations and has also proven to be resilient itself. Through the years, priorities were adjusted to respond to the emerging challenges and needs. We have ensured that we are consistently aligning the response to national priorities and the constantly working to ensure government engagement at all levels. Moving forward in the current context, with the continued high presence of refugees in Lebanon, we want to reiterate the importance of a future approach that preserves the integrated nature of LCRP, humanitarian and resilience, supports host communities and refugees, and also maintains government co-ownership. It is vital that we continue to build on the LCRP achievements in partnership with UN agencies and our partners. Here, I would like to express my thankfulness to the strong and solid partnership between the government, UNDP, and UNHCR in co-leading this response in Lebanon. And we believe that we should enhance and improve it and make it more solid in the coming years. As this is the final year of the current LCRP framework, we are undergoing a strategic review to better understand what has worked well and what hasn't. And the initial findings indicate that the design of the LCRP is good and appropriately balanced. It addresses immediate needs within a long-term view, mainly through strengthening the Lebanese system. The response has evolved significantly, significantly <clears throat> over the last six years from a purely refugee-focused response to an integrated response that combines stabilization elements for the medium term. Throughout the last year, we have advanced on social safety net and social protection, which build on previous work to enhance multi-purpose cash assistance and uh, explore linking complementary services from other sectors. Efforts to assess and strengthen alignment between humanitarian actors and the government's socially, social safety net continue. The Ministry of Social Affairs also continues to prioritize the development of an overarching strategy on social protection, and we count on your engagement and support to bring this into fruition. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Abiyali, for bringing some of the lessons and also some of uh, uh, the challenges of the 3RP seen, uh, seen from uh, uh, Lebanon. Um, now to Bangkok and to New York, Indrika and uh, Mrs. van der Veren, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Pedro. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen and friends, I think it's really uh, an opportune moment for me and Claire to talk about a very important, uh, I think, uh, collaboration in the Asia Pacific, and that's uh, about the solution strategy for Afghan refugees. Um, as the previous speakers have said, this is very much in the spirit of our joint collaboration. And I think um, in the Asia Pacific, there are quite a few um, hallmark, I would say, collaborative uh, ventures together with UNDP and UNHCR. Uh, the Afghan situation, as we call it, is one with the country of origin, Afghanistan, and the two principal countries of asylum. Pakistan hosting uh, some 1.5 million registered refugees, Iran close to a million. And then you also have uh, a collaboration beyond that in the Bangladesh-Myanmar theater as well, very much in the spirit of the nexus and making our collaboration practical and impactful Within the, within the larger frame of um, the humanitarian development peace nexus um, paradigm, which we are trying to operationalize. And I think the solution strategy for Afghan refugees is a case in point where we can also 
highlight that collaboration impacting people. Uh, the Solution Strategy for Afghan Refugees was launched in 2012 um, as an effort to really look at long-term solutions for forced displacement situations. And from that very point, UNDP has been a partner in the Solution Strategy, also making the point to host countries and partners that sustainable solutions for forcibly displaced and refugees is not just a humanitarian set of actions, but a development set of actions. And that that partnership is incredibly important for communities to become stabilized and resilient. And uh, in recognition of that, I think was why the solution strategy was also chosen to be a theater in which a support platform was launched uh, as colleagues said before in the global refugee forum in 2019. And last year, we uh, put together a core group uh, around the support platform with 13 member states and key development partners and international financial institutions, the World Bank, ADB and UNDP being the very backbone of that partnership. And there alone, I think, is butching realism to that relationship of delivering on these outcomes. So some key points of the support platform and the work we do under the solution strategy. I think one is really echoing maybe the four, the, triple, the quadruple R's of repatriation, reintegration, rehabilitation, and reconstruction as, as some of the parameters we had set out collaboratively before. It looks at an area-based approach within Afghanistan in 40 priority areas identified by the government from which refugees originate in the countries of origin based on the data we have and the evidence we have on their areas of origin, areas to which refugees have already repatriated and areas from which there's been internal displacement. As you know, almost 3 million IDPs are in Afghanistan as we speak in a very volatile, uh, situation, dynamic, complex situation in Afghanistan today. So the focus here is amongst the broad partnership of the development partners, UNDP, UNHCR, critically working with the Afghan government within the frame of the Afghan National Peace and Development Framework, making interventions in, I would say, three primary areas linked to the SDGs. SDG 3, enhancing access to education, it's SDG 4, access to, uh, sorry, SDG 3 for health, SDG 4 for education and skills, social protection and livelihoods, because we believe collectively that these are very important elements within the larger development set of interventions that make communities resilient and makes return and reintegration, albeit for refugees or IDPs, a success. And I think the core group of the support platform really is a, a very um, committed set of collaborators around this endeavor. And the development humanitarian investments in these areas are also enabling cohesion, coexistence, and a dialogue amongst communities. We do not differentiate who's in these communities. So as such, there also has the peace dividends in this process. And that I think is one important part of the whole nexus set of issues. In the host countries in Pakistan, again, a long collaboration with UNDP originally almost 10 years ago in the refugee hosting and refugee affected areas programs, Raha, looking at social inclusion, economic inclusion, which has really um, brought about a, a level of a coexistence for the refugees 40 years on from their initial displacement. So to sum up, I think in the interest of time, uh, what we've done is country level work plans, looking at how we can impact in these areas, in these particular sectors, the communities to enhance their sustainability and their resilience. Again, keeping in mind the extreme volatility right now in Afghanistan, just this year alone, in addition to the 2.9 million IDPs, we had 160,000 internally displaced persons due to conflict this year alone. And you have seen the indication indicators related to violence. And uh, we have now also collaborated to have a joint consultancy to further develop joint programming for the region and to mobilize a diverse set of partners 
to bring in financial, technical, and knowledge base as well into capacitating programs here. The framework remains very much the SDGs, and as I said, the triple nexus. And I think at the end of the day, if I were to uh, look at one point that resonates here from this experience is that that level of collaboration translating to joined up action, leveraging each partner's comparative advantage has impacted the lives of people directly. And I think to that extent, this is in a way the triple nexus at work. And our collaboration, I think, is impacting the lives of many disadvantaged people at a time when there's so much uncertainty, it is still staying and delivering. Thank you. Thank you. So um, to add um, uh, some uh, uh, points to the, the very good points made by Andrika, some perspectives. Uh, in the Asia Pacific region, uh, as Andrika has said, uh, UNDP and UNHCR cooperate to support both the people affected by displacement and their host communities. We support multiple levels of government to address the root causes of displacement and promote resilience-based development that helps communities recover from the multiple shocks they face in a way that is sustainable and localized for each community. As Indrika has shared, indeed a key pathway to this collaboration has been through our membership of the core group of the support platform for the solution strategy for Afghan refugees with cooperation in and across the three countries. Within Afghanistan, uh, from a, a UNDP perspective, we see pockets of multidimensional poverty and overlapping vulnerabilities compounded by displacement. And these factors have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. UNDP's uh, report series, The Return Journey, highlights the lack of employment uh, support and the lack of housing as key barriers to reintegration for returnees from Pakistan to Afghanistan. This type of uh, research is uh, some of the, the um, uh, things that UNDP brings to the partnership. In order to promote uh, the sustainable and long-term reintegration of Afghan refugees, we're working with UNHCR and other partners to support, for example, the Ministry of Refugees and other local ministries to integrate migration, movement, and return into long-term planning at the national and local levels aligned with the National Development Framework. I think other speakers have also uh, highlighted the importance uh, of this integration into national planning. Our, our partnership with UNHCR is now expanding to address uh, cross-border displacement dynamics and returns from Iran and, and Pakistan, as uh, Indrika has also mentioned. To give you a, a concrete example um, of an expanded partnership uh, with the Global Fund, UNHCR and IOM, we're working through national tuberculosis control programs to address the urgent threat of TB amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and increase access to care and prevention among Afghan refugees, returnees, and mobile population in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iran. Uh, Indrika mentioned our, our joint work in Pakistan, uh, you know, very important also the dimension of building on our past um, cooperation and successes in this case, particularly to address legal and human rights challenges uh, the uh, refugees, Afghan refugees face. Looking forward, we are uh, developing with UNHCR uh, a series of joint country initiatives, as well as a cross-border sub-regional strategy for a coordinated response to refugees, IDPs, and host communities across Afghanistan, Iran, and Pakistan. And we will look at portable skills and access to decent work as part of the solution. I think this was mentioned also very early on in, in, uh, in this um, conference. Looking more broadly, our cooperation with UNHCR through the SSAR is a good example of the partnerships needed to address forced displacement comprehensively. I think it's important to note uh, this, that displaced households across the region mostly live in and around cities with humanitarian needs combined with issues of governance, economic and social exclusion, and duty bearer capacity deficits. 
and now also the COVID-19 pandemic. So the value add of uh, our partnership, the UNDP and uh, UNHCR, allows us to integrate the response to humanitarian needs and manage access to displaced populations with analyses and services that promote resilient livelihoods and a pathway out of precarity. We are combining the strength, the strength of both our organizations um, in a, a number of areas with uh, com community assessment, quick impact uh, projects, together with the social cohesion and community resilience type of intervention uh, and as much as possible um, in uh, under area-based uh, programming uh, where the conditions so allow. UNDP is also doing research and policy work to help anticipate the displacement challenges countries across the Asia-Pacific region face because of climate change. And our collaboration with UNHCR is essential to ensure that this centers on people on the move. So we look forward very much uh, to deepening our partnership with UNHCR as we, as we move forward to support governments and partners in the region to address both humanitarian and development aspects of displacement in a coherent and coordinated manner. Thank you. Thank you, Claire and Indrika. Mrs. McGuire, the floor is yours uh, to, to talk on, on the MIRPS. Thank, thank you, you so much, Pedro. And thank you to UNDP's Crisis Bureau and UNHCR for the invitation. It's been really interesting to listen to colleagues. So I'll try to condense my comments to, to add things rather than repeat. So as you know, I mean, the, the region of Latin America uh, and the Caribbean and particularly Central America, which is where the MERPS focuses, it's, an, it's a region impacted by violence, by economic crisis, by environmental, climate change and inequality. And these challenges have of course intensified with COVID-19 as well as the recent uh, hurricanes. And so that has an important, uh, you know, effect, if you will, on human mobility. So the MERPS, uh, just for those of you who don't know it, is the Spanish acronym for the Comprehensive Regional Protection and Solutions Framework. And it represents a practical response by six countries in Central America, um, plus Mexico, to find solutions uh, for the implementation of the, the Global Compact on Refugees in particular. And the MERP support platform, which Luca referenced earlier, works to mobilize political, technical, and financial efforts um, in this direction. So the UNHCR, UNDP work in Central America really is framed within this governmental space of the MERPs. Um, and both agencies have really sought to design joint responses to address the resource requirements. Um, so here I just want to mention briefly our experience um, focusing on municipal level capacity and addressing medium term recovery needs. So municipal level and medium term of the local communities and of course of the of course of the displaced populations. Um, specifically, we have a toolkit that UNDP and UNHCR have designed uh, for local authorities that support them in local development planning. And I think this is a good practice because it's been developed with the participation of the local authorities and therefore we believe reflects a certain understanding of their specific needs in the context of limited resources. It has four pillars, the toolkit. One is incorporation of forced displacement and local development planning. One on protection and access to essential services. One on the rule of law and e-governance. Um, and one on socioeconomic integration and social cohesion. So it's a nice blend of different perspectives and you know, short, medium and longer term planning. It will be officially launched uh, at the next MERPS governmental consultation. So in terms of just some things that have worked well and less well uh, in bringing humanitarian development interventions closer together because and approaches, because I see that's a very dynamic part of the chat. Um, I'd say first that you know hu human mobility flows in the region tend to be medium and long-term in nature, which means that of course, rapid humanitarian action is essential to save lives. But when people remain displaced for years, development interventions are also essential to ensure sustainable solutions and of course get at the root causes. So in this way, the UNDP UNHCR joint initiative in Central America and this toolkit that I mentioned really does use that integrated approach of humanitarian and development and provides local authorities with very concrete strategies, tactics, you know, to improve their planning and promote access um, to public services and socioeconomic schemes. So 
we also think it was a good example of uh, our technical teams coming together uh, at the operational technical level, our country offices contributing to this interagency work. Uh, and from our perspective as UNDP, we see sort of the governance and inclusion piece of the equation as something that we can add add value on. Um, so just uh, finally on what we could do better, um, I'd say that you know it would have been ideal to to involve local authorities far earlier in the process of elaborating this toolkit, but there were electoral processes happening in many of the countries in the region that proved challenging, of course, um, with this kind of initiative. And then um, finally, maybe one element we could focus on more in the future, and, and a previous panelist mentioned this is access by refugees and internally displaced persons to labor markets to support them in their uh, entrepreneurial endeavors, if you will. But that requires adequate education, access, and access to training opportunities, and thereby breaking the cycle of, of dependency and poverty. Um, so to close, really, UNDP, we look forward in the region um, to continuing our work, our strong collaboration with UNHCR and other agencies of, this, of the development system to really promote that socioeconomic uh, integration and access to effective governance for migrants, including displaced persons and, and refugees. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Linda, for that uh, over, overview. Um, obviously, a key component of UNHCR, UNDP collaboration on forced displacement is the role and the commitment of uh, donors. We will hear next uh, uh, from uh, Mr. Marte from INTPA, uh, that uh, perspective, and I invite him. Uh, Monsieur Marte, c'est à vous. Dear colleagues, um, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, all the individual cases that were uh, presented are extremely interesting uh, and, and would deserve a lot of further uh, discussion. And there are plenty of questions also in the, in the chat that are very, very interesting to discuss. But with the time we have, I really would like to thank uh, UNDP and UNHCR for inviting to take part and speak. And I see this invitation also as a sign of the close partnership that we have you you asked me to speak as a donor, but uh, in fact, I, I think I will uh, rather talk about partnership. Uh, both organizations are strategic partners for the European Commission and certainly for my Directorate General, International Partnership, as it is its new name, the former DEFCO. I would say a few words about our own path towards uh, taking forced displacement into consideration for development assistance to tell you that your challenges are also our challenges. Uh, it has been a long process, uh, largely parallel to the transformation path of uh, the UN agencies that uh, we have heard. Just to say that under our previous development assistance cycle, 2014-20, forced displacement was not mentioned as a target. Asylum was to an extent, but not with the logic of sharing the burden of host countries. There were occasionally development projects benefiting refugees, but for the bulk, forced displacement was not considered as a development issue and was rather left to our humanitarian colleagues of ECHO. So it is with refugees, notably from Syria, knocking at our doors six years ago that we realized the challenge that we had to address. And also, of course, the much bigger challenge that the hosting countries were addressing, all the more because a large majority of them are developing countries. So a policy shift was made in 2016 with the policy document on forced displacement and development precisely. We have recognized the magnitude and the complexity of the challenge, its protracted nature, the need for a development-oriented approach. We have also recognized the challenge for IDPs and the importance of host communities. And this work was done jointly by ECHO and at the time DEFCO, uh, my, my DG. This first shift in policy was followed by a funding shift, notably through the ad hoc trust funds, the Syria crisis, trust fund Turkey, Africa, and very significant amounts have been dedicated in this way to force displacement. And these two shifts were also reflected in the renewed formulations of the EU consensus on development. Of course, the work done at the UN, New York Declaration Global Refugee Compact, has accompanied also the change of the EU approach 
even in some cases, notably in the Horn of Africa, it is our cooperation with several uh, stakeholders, and particularly UNHCR, in that case with IGAD, that has contributed to uh, the supporting narrative for long-term solutions oriented on self-reliance-oriented perspective. Well, now in our international partnership priorities on our new financial instrument for the new uh, cycle for seven years, there is explicit reference for displacement along with migration. And there is even a spending target of 10% of the budget to migration and forced displacement, which represents almost 8 billion euros. It's impossible at this stage to say how much will go to forced displacement. Surely some will be implemented in partnership with the UN agencies, but uh, we don't know yet. The only very important point is that now it will be programmed. And you know how it is important for development agency to program the assistance. Important note, we will have to report about our spending to our political authorities, the European Parliament, the Council, which will imply we will need to monitor very closely our, our operations. Uh, the shift has been made in developing a closer relationship with UNHCR. And just one sign of that, last year, UNHCR, uh, since, la since last year, UNHCR has helped identifying the countries where, in their view, a development intervention of the Commission on forced displacement would be particularly justified. So of course, we retain our responsibility on our decision whether or not to follow the advice, but we, of course, also take into account. And UNHCR has always been very keen on insisting that it was not fundraising, but awareness raising in the spirit of the GCR. And I think it is fair to say that it is the case. So we have reiterated our commitment at the Global Refugee Forum. And because we support the, the, the implementation of the compact, we have full, fully embraced the development of the, of the refugee support platforms, of which we have heard uh, for several of them. And we are very involved in, 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 in the three of them. Definitely, regional cooperation matters. As EU, we strongly support the reform of the UN development system. We do it with resources, with political capital, as a concrete translation of our support to multilateralism. And in that sense, we absolutely support the greater cooperation between UN agencies, and particularly UNDP and UNHCR, what we have heard, that both have a clear mandate that need to be articulated on issues that are both priorities for the EU. Similarly, we fully support the reorganization of the UN country teams, and we really expect them to jointly deliver on priorities as per the Agenda 2030. On this, I would just make a, a specific point on the fact that we expect the UN family to be able to report about the inclusion of refugees, IDPs, and migrants into the implementation of the Agenda 2030. Although we, we know clearly it's a challenge, also in terms of convincing the national authorities about doing that. But this is the development agenda and should really fully factor in the this for displacement dimension. We fully support the fact that UNHCR works more on the development dimension on the linkages. And likewise, we expect UNDP to fully integrate for displacement and include forcibly displaced persons as well as migrants in their operations. All of us, we need working in avoiding silos within organizations and between organizations. That's the spirit of the Nexus. Clearly, it applies to the EU as well, between our humanitarian development and diplomatic uh, arms. And clearly, for us as well, it's not without challenges. But also, I have to say, with real improvements in our functioning in the recent years. Definitely, we need to work on the development dimension from the outset of uh, this displacement crisis instead of building parallel systems, which has proven to be ineffective and, of course, risk also to generate competition, if not conflicts, between beneficiaries. I found very uh, striking the presentation made on Gambela. I had the pleasure to visit Gambela uh, in a UNHCR donor visit, and I, indeed, it was very visual what our colleague uh, explained. Uh, inclusion in the ordinary national structures should really be as much as possible the objective. Of course, partnership with host countries is critical on recognizing their leadership. Of course, this is how development assistance works. We also need to work with local and especially urban authorities, with civil society, the private sector. 
clearly there, there is something to be done with the help of UNDP in terms of the local governance. Uh, and of course, we need also to work with the displaced pers persons themselves. So again, need to cooperate between us across and within the respective man mandate. I would just, in the rest of time, just mention two, two more points. One is the fact that there is an, an additional dimension for us in the EU, which is that we are not trying to develop with our member states what we have called Team Europe initiatives, and that will apply also in the area of force displacement. The idea is really to work together to really avoid again the silos and the limits, to have more effective partnership and complementarity, to avoid fragmentation and gaps. So as you have heard, there is really for us a considerable convergence of the narrative and the operation with what UNHCR and UNDP have developed recently. So if I have one plea for concluding is really to, to encourage you to continue engaging with your partners, your donors, having in mind their constraints, our constraints, and helping them to adjust their narrative and their practice to what the new challenges are. I will, there will be much more to say, but I will just stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Marte, uh, for the emphasis on the on the partnerships, complementing a very uh, a very dense, rich, diverse, and uh, definitely thought-provoking sequence of uh, of interventions. Um, I would uh, invite, and we are beyond uh, our our schedule. I will invite our my colleagues, uh, Roberta and and Luca, for a wrapping uh, reflection. Uh, Roberta, over to you, and thank you to all. Yes. Pedro, thank you very much. Just a very quick thought. We, we heard many examples of close collaboration between UNDP and UNHCR in the field in many different operational contexts. And we see the same challenge that force displacement is reversing very often and too often development gains. There's no single actor that can, can address this challenge alone. And we need development partners to be next to humanitarians. I like very much, I appreciated very much the comment of Erwan when uh, he, he, he pointed out we don't have to see uh, some of us as, as donors and implementers, but we really, uh, in the spirit of having a strategic collaboration, we need to put our minds together. We need to help each other to understand each other's realities better and create synergies that will result into a better work uh, for a better impact on the population we, we, we care for. Thank you very much, uh, Luca, over to you. Thank you, Roberta. I have the pleasure now to, to give the final words for this. That's been a very, very rich discussion. And I want to thank all the, the, the panelists uh, for making uh, time to be with us uh, today um, in their very busy schedule. Uh, I also want to thank everyone for giving the, the perspective from a, from a partner. Um, it, what what really was common in all the presentation was this was this integrated approach. You know, the, 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 you see elements of governance combined with you know jobs and livelihoods, social cohesion and peace building, access to justice, uh, all uh, integrating the, the the strength and the, and the mandate that UNHCR and and, and, and UNDP uh, bring. It's very powerful, and of course, all of this is part of the uh, national response plan. Uh, the country cooperation of, U of the UN, and it is supported by a large number of, of partners on, on the ground. And the EU in particular is one of our of the, of, of the largest um, contributor to that. And uh, it's, it's not just about uh, funds, but it's also about uh, alignment of, of vision and strategies. Um, from our end, uh, um, just to reiterate that you know, inclusion and solutions will remain at the heart of this partnership. Uh, there's lots of unfinished business, lots of things we can do uh, better, but definitely the commitment is there to, to further deepen and, and strengthen this, this collaboration. Once again, um, thank you all. Um, uh, it has been also rather humbling sometimes to, 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 to hear uh, the efforts that are uh, undergoing uh, in some difficult context. Uh, so also very uh, telling to see, you know, very senior uh, uh, colleagues joining us um, uh, for this discussion. It, 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 it bears witness of, of, the, of the real 
corporate commitment that exists in the two organization. And I take the um, I take note, we take note of, of also everyone's comment that this has to be reflected in, in our strategic plans, in our you know, operational and planning uh, instrument, and, uh, and we will certainly do so. With that, um, thank you so much to everyone. And over to Pedro, I think we can close the event. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Close, indeed. Thank you to all. Thank you, Luca. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.